Welcome to First United Methodist Church. My name is Greg Tony. I am an associate pastor here. We welcome our online viewers as well. Today's theme of the sermon is called Unforeseen Possibilities. It's, we're going to be talking about miracles, so stay tuned. Today's reading is from the Gospel of John. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about five thousand in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told the disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and minds be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. The Bible is full of mystery stories. Just choose a book from the Hebrew Bible. For example, Ezekiel. Bones that lay dry and lifeless in the middle of the valley come back together. Of course, there's Exodus. Moses stretches out his hand and the waters part. The Psalms, O oh Lord, I have cried out to you, and you have healed me. The New Testament is full of miracles as well. Water is turned to wine, lame people walk, blind people see, demons disappear. In today's reading from the Gospel according to John, we encounter two miracle stories. First, Jesus feeds the 5,000 with, uh, with uh, five loaves of bread and two fish. Then he walks on the Sea of Galilee. Sometimes our, or sometimes our contemporary minds have a hard time believing in miracles from the ancient text of Scripture. These scriptures were written, after all, by and for people who believed in the miraculous. We likely lean more in the direction of disbelief. We come up with rational explanations for, um, for un unforeseen circumstances. Maybe there was a big stash of fish and bread hidden behind a tree or a bush which Jesus used to feed the people. That sounds kind of silly, doesn't it? Maybe the disciples in the boat only dreamed that Jesus was walking towards them across the water. 
you know, today belief in miracles has come to be the butt of jokes or the subject of, sar of sarcasm. You remember the character of Father Guido Sarducci on Saturday Night Live? I hear chuckles. The character was a chain-smoking Italian priest invented by comedian Don Novello. On one SNL episode, Sarducci was complaining about the canonization of Mother Elizabeth Seton, an American nun. The Vatican had waived the four miracle requirement for, um, for, for, for sainthood, and Sarducci, in his exaggerated Italian accent, complains. I know a Italian priest with the thousands of miracles under their belt. Mother Elizabeth had a measly three miracles. And you know what? I'd heard two of them were card tricks. <laughs> he was a great character. This is sarcasm. This is not taking uh, miracles seriously. All of which brings up the question, do we believe in miracles? I am aided in my own response by something Harry Emerson Fosdick said. The common impression is that unintell the unintelligent who believe in miracles. But the fact is the great minds who believe most fervently in unforeseen miracles. Let me repeat that. The common impression is that it is the unintelligent who believe in miracles. But the fact is that great minds who believe most fervently in miracles. They call them unforeseen possibilities. So let's hold on to that idea of unforeseen possibilities as we look at John's account of the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on the water. The two stories are coupled together, indicating their prominence in the life of the early Christian community and the commonality of their message. First, the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus had been in Jerusalem when, de when distrust of him by religious re leaders became too much for him. He returns to Galilee. Great numbers of people follow him wherever he goes, impressed by his power to heal the sick. One day he is sitting with his disciples on the mountainside, having a moment of rest from the demands of his ministry. When he looks up, he sees a large crowd coming toward him. No one has, uh, immediately he focused on their need. No one has expressed that need to him, but Jesus knows that they are hungry. He says to Philip, where are we going to buy bread for all these people to eat? Philip is worried. So ever the realist, he answers, six months wages would not be enough to feed all the people. Andrew, the practical disciple, follows up. There is a boy with five barley loaves and two fish, but what good is that to this big crowd? Neither disciple is wrong. There is a great need, and there, there are what appear to be few resources to meet that need. Jesus doesn't argue with them. Then, but what he does, he directs the disciples to tell everybody to sit down on the grass. Then he takes two loaves, and when he has given thanks to God, he distributes them, the bread and the fish, as much as the hungry people want. When all is said and done, there are 12 baskets of bread and fish left over. Notice that the Gospel of John does not focus on a miracle, but on feeding the hungry. Hungry people come to Jesus and leave satisfied. And to top it off, there's plenty left over. Here we could have been called, here could have been called a revelation that comes by means of a story about a miracle. It reveals both Jesus' divine capacity to know, to know immediately the needs of the people and his response to that need with extravagant, extravagant compassion. Indeed, an overabundance of compassion to which the baskets of leftovers attest. The word compassion comes from two Latin roots. Com means with, of course, and passion means deep feeling over the suffering of others. In the end, Jesus will respond with compassion to the needs of the whole world by giving his life on the cross. 
And each time we eat the bread and drink the cup at the Lord's Supper, we taste the miracle of the meal as real, real redemptive presence of Christ in our broken world. I am the bread of life, he said. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. Now the people following Jesus come to taste and see the good news of Jesus. They will ultimately develop an acquired taste for this goodness as they grow in their faith. They will sing, It is well with my soul. Do you all remember that old hymn, It is well with my soul? It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Kale knows it. I could hear him humming it. <laughs> they will come to know that it is no secret what God can do. They will come to know that Jesus is more than enough. Why? Because Jesus cares. The crowd followed because Jesus cares. The feeding of the 5,000 is what is called divine disclosure. It discloses that God is not only for us, God is with us in the person of Jesus, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Now that, now, now that is truly amazing, that is truly amazing. Is God present here? How is he present? Well, we're here. The setting of this scene is like the Feast of Unleavened Bread, celebrating God's liberation of the Hebrew people from the slavery in Egypt. Think of how on their journey to freedom the Lord provided them manna in the desert. Now Jesus will free the people from all that separates them from God and one another. He provides them with nourishing spiritual food along the way. And he is ushering them into a new reality of God's reign on earth as it is in heaven. But some in the well-fed crowd didn't exactly get it. They want a powerful king with a scepter and a crown, chariots and horses. In other words, an earthly king. But Jesus is not that kind of king. He reveals that the truly, true transformative power of God is at the power of unconditional self-giving love. Who would have thought that in that day? Jesus by nature was perhaps the greatest unforeseen possibility of all time. We still struggle ourselves to get our minds around that. I think of Paul's words, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are saved it is the power of God. So back in Galilee, evening comes and darkness closes in. While Jesus is still off by himself, the disciples decide it's time to head to Capernaum. And off they go in their little boat, sailing upon smooth water as darkness falls. But then suddenly, the sea becomes rough because a strong wind is blowing. Choppy waters batter the boat. Have you ever been in that position? It's scary. This goes on for three or four miles, a very long distance when the wind is against you. Then the disciples see Jesus walking across the water and coming towards them. Already frightened by the peril they in, seeing Jesus really terrifies them. Perhaps they think he is a ghost. Perhaps it is their habitual inability to be, see unforeseen possibilities just as they'd been on the mountain when Philip and Andrew couldn't imagine feeding that many people. Jesus says to the disciples, It is I. Do not be afraid. They want to take him into the boat, but immediately they reach the land toward which they had been rowing. Now Jesus' authority over the unruly sea is further revelation that he is the Son of the God who formed this earth. When darkness covered the deep, while a wind swept over the face of the waters, it was a revelation that the, good of, that the God who said to Moses, my name is I am, is to be found fully in Jesus Christ.
the Redeemer of the world. I am is here again, beside the storm-tossed boat in the presence of Jesus. He knew the danger his friends were in, even from far away. I take great comfort in the thought that when my own dark and stormy nights threaten to undo me, I have every right to expect the real presence and power of God in Christ to get me through. Shannon Kirshner, a pastor at Fourth Presbyterian Church in Chicago, said, God does some of the best work in the dark. After the crucifixion, when all appeared to be lost, when everything was dark, Jesus was buried in a stone-cold tomb. God raised him from the dead. That was an incredible miracle, wasn't it? Back on board the boat, the disciples were rowing in the dark, in the middle of a situation over which they had no control. You and I will, no doubt, sail in that same boat one time or another before we die. Illness strikes, a job is lost, a relationship dies. We keep trying, but the wind blows us back. Even in regular daily life, things can get really choppy and frustrating. Hardly anybody gets smooth sailing 24-7. We all can take comfort in the thought that God knows what we need. In little messes and through big catastrophes, God can change terrible situations into ones of possibility. Always listen out for that voice coming from another realm that says, be not afraid, you can handle this. I will help you. You can handle anything with me by your side. So in the end, I believe in miracles, do you? I believe in them because they happen all the time. William Sloan Coffin said it better than I can. Miracles do not a Messiah make, but a Messiah can do miracles. If you ask me if Jesus literally walked on the water, I will answer. And this is Coffin speaking. For certain, I do not know, but I do, this I do know. Faith must be lived before it is understood. And the more it is lived, the more things become possible. I can also report that in home after home, I have seen Jesus change sinners into saints, hate-filled relations into loving ones, cowardice into courage, the fatigue of despair into the buoyancy of hope. In instance after instance, life after life, I have seen Christ's power unto salvation, and that's miracle enough for me. So, yes, Jesus does perform miracles even today. The miracle stories we have heard today tell us that God is ever-present in the person of Jesus. Jesus, whose redeeming work is not confined to one time and place, but is real and active in every time and place. Our church sits at the corner of North Boulevard and T.J. Jemison Boulevard, downtown Baton Rouge, but it reaches across the city, the state, the country, and the world. Through its mission work, its services on TV, morning prayer on Facebook, book packs for kids who can't afford them. Can you name some of the unforeseen possibilities that I have not named? The Scottish preacher James Stewart put it this way, All things are yours in Christ. Forgiveness, yours. Hope and peace and courage, yours. There is no trial that cannot meet. There is no trial you cannot meet as a conqueror. No perplexity you cannot master to the glory of God in the here and now. It's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing, but true. Amen.